Hello, everybody. Um, I am Jason Haas, partner and general manager here at Tablas Creek. Welcome to my Wednesday live broadcast. Um, I am very excited to be inviting uh, Greg Duty, who is the CEO of Vineyard Brands, which is the import company that represents us nationally and which my dad founded back 50 years ago, um, to talk about. Um, into wine, which is not a, not a normal journey, um, which I think is going to be really fun to explore. But uh, before I do that, um, I am going to give you a little tour of what's going on here. So hello to everybody who just said hello, including my sister. Hi, Becca. Um, okay, a little tour of what's going on here at uh, the vineyard. So the big thing that we are doing right now is we are harvesting. Um, the crush pad is covered in grapes. Um, we have um, Grenache and Morvedra coming in as we speak. Um, we did a Grenache Blanc pick this morning. Um, we're in the middle of Roussan. Um, really, it's, uh, it's full go time. We crossed the halfway point of harvest um, this past week. You can see the entire left column of um, our, our big harvest chalkboard is, is now full. We're starting in the second column. Um, things look good. Uh, that means that every day we are going out, we're taking samples of blocks that we think might be ready. This is a, um, a Roussan block and a Grenache block. Um, and this is David Maduena, our longtime vineyard manager um, who is doing the testing. It also means that we are going in and measuring the progress on all of the barrels that we have fermenting and all the tanks that we have fermenting in the cellar. It's a it's a, it's a long day. There's a reason why um, we, we stagger people's shifts in the cellar at this time of year. There's a reason why we bring in a couple of interns, uh, including Jake Holbrook right here in, the, in this picture. It's just a, it's a, lot to, it's a lot to tackle. Okay, in the vineyard itself, um, you will notice that the sky is blue. We do not have smoke um, here at the, at, at the surface or even up above anymore, which is lovely. Um, a couple picks from our, a couple pictures from our Morvedra picking today. Um, we're picking some head train Morvedra at the extreme western edge of the property. Um, let's see with these vines. These are planted very wide space, very old fashioned planting, dry farmed, head trained, 350 to 400 vines per acre. Um, there are more and more blocks that are, that look like this. This is a Senso block. This has already been picked. You can see um, at this point, it's just, uh, it's just the vines themselves. Um, but there are also still about five grape varieties that we still have fruit on. So I'm going to run through them quickly. Uh, first, Tanat. This is a head trained Tanat vine that was almost, it's almost as tall as I am. Um, you can see all those clusters of fruit that are right there in the center, kind of centered near the trunk. Um, we have Morvedra, lots of Morvedra out there. We just, again, just started picking Morvedra and it's our largest component of what we have in the cellar or have in the vineyard. Roussan, you can see it's starting to get that russet kind of orangey brown um, tone that it gets when it's ripe. We're about halfway through our Roussan harvest. Uh, Grenache, um, those of you who joined us for some of our International Grenache Day festivities last week probably saw more Grenache pictures than, than uh, you knew what to do with. But um, it is, it's such a beautiful grape. And here's one more photo that shows that vine from underneath, but also the blue sky behind it. Um, and then finally, last grape, probably the, it's the only grape that we haven't started picking. I think this is true, um, is Kunwaz. And uh, you can see why it was famous as a table grape um, back in the day, because it is, uh, I mean, it's big and juicy and, and really delicious. Okay, um, that is enough. I'm going to turn off the pictures, and I am going to invite Greg to join. Okay. Okay. Um, so, again, if you have questions that you would like either of us to answer, please, um, please add them in the chat and, uh, and we'll, we'll try to address them. Hi, Greg. Hi, Jason. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really well. Those are beautiful pictures of the grapes. It's such a beautiful time of year. It's... Yeah. And I'm so happy to see the blue sky as opposed to the smoke sky. Tell me about it. So, well done. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty apocalyptic here not last week, but the week before was, was really pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, and even though we were lucky, there was no smoke really at the surface. 
Um, still, it meant that like it had this sort of yellow overcast the whole time. It was it was kind of horrifying. Um, yeah. Did not make you want to be outside. Um, did not give you much hope for the the what was going on in California. But it, right. yeah, things are a lot better. Good, glad to hear it. Um, cool. So I would love if you are if you are willing to to have you tell people a little bit about your journey into wine because you did not take the normal route of uh, <laughs> of studying it in school or of. Uh, starting to work at a restaurant and, uh, and ending up in distribution like talk talk about what uh, talk about your journey you mean why i'm crazy <laughs> so i started out um right after school i was an accountant and then i went to law school and i was a normal lawyer so i worked for a firm for a while but then i got into the restructuring business that was super fun but a little bit exhausting because um it's a young person's game so I did a couple of those that were two to three years each. And then I decided that to move on to something else and retire basically. So I went to culinary school at the French Culinary Institute in Soho in New York. And I loved it, but I was a little bit too old to be a chef and stand up all day. So they also offered this, um, I think they called it intense, sum intensive sommelier training course at the what's now the International Culinary Center. So um, I took that and I loved it. And the master sommeliers, I think there are about 11 master sommeliers involved in the course, either you know, as instructors or proctors for the tests or that. But they said, you know, oh, you're too young to retire. Why don't you go into wine importing? And they were all, this was all separately. So they didn't all get together obviously and say, why don't you do this? But they just said, you know, why, did, why, why don't you do this? And I said, well, I don't know anything about it. And I, they said, do you, well, do you know anyone in the business? I said, I know Jerry Neff of Vineyard Brands, but, and they go, oh, we don't know him, but we love the portfolio. You should talk to him. So I called Jerry and I said, hey, Jerry, I, apparently I'm supposed to be a wine importer. Can you, <laughs> can I, can I come talk to you? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I walked into his office literally, and I've, I've been retired now for six months, I think. And he, I walked in, I said, hey, Jerry, how are you? And he's like, he said, do you want my job? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I just want to hear about why I'm supposed to be a wine importer. <laughs> anyway, so we kept talking back and forth for, I guess it was about a year until he's like, oh, come on, why don't you try it? And I said, okay, let's try it. And so we did a sort of a year long test period. And here I am, seven years later, almost. Oh, my gosh, can you believe it? Yeah. So you essentially had the mid career equivalent of like the the high school guidance counselor that says okay fill out all of these things oh you should manage a fish hatchery or you <laughs> exactly. should go into whatever on deep sea diving or um, exactly came up with wine importing and you made it happen that's that's amazing yeah it's and it's been it's been it's been a great ride you know lots have changed obviously in the in the um in the industry and with the company as you know but um i i'm actually really happy that I did the restructuring business because that sort of sets you up for the tariffs that came last October and now COVID. So it makes you not, it makes you not freak out by nature. So I just sort of, you know, you just sort of in restructuring, you just sort of move on, you know, set your goal and just sort of get, get to it. So that's what we've been doing lately. So, so, so Vineyard Brands, I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, Vineyard Brands was started by my dad in 1973. Um, I mean, it, it was sort of evolved out of um, the a brokerage import business that he that he had in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and it started in a uh, the converted barn of the farmhouse that I grew up in, in Vermont. Um, then Where it, Rebecca we, lives today, right? Yeah, where my sister lives today. Uh, my oh. sister, who is watching right now, I think I saw her saw her name pop up. So Hi, Rebecca, she's probably watching from that barn. <laughs> right. Um, so, and then my dad retired little by little over the course of the first half of the 1990s. Um, and Jerry, who had been his number two at Vineyard Brands, um, took over as the as the president, and then moved the offices to Alabama in ninety six ninety seven. 97 yep cool well I'm... and that's another that's another good story right because jerry just didn't you know the barn was a little bit remote for if you have to travel a lot 
And apparently, according to him, which you never know if that was right or not, but it was treacherous getting up there in the winter and even in the summer. Absolutely true. So um, anyway, so he wanted to move, but he liked all the people there. So he, he wanted to move it to a city that was bigger and there was more of a, you know, that you could get in and out of easier. So that with, a re with an airport that was, you know, in the city. So, but he as didn't want- near, As opposed to the nearest airport being two states away. <laughs> right, exactly. But so, and, but he really wanted all the people to come. And he said, you know, look, if I move to say Atlanta or Dallas or Chicago or something like that, they may not come because they're, they're Vermonters and they're used to not living in a big city. So he, his wife was from Birmingham and she said, what about Birmingham? You know, it's a million people, but you can live outside the city on, you know, you can get property and you can sort of recreate that, um, you know, that, that sort of non-urban feel for all the people. And I think, I think all but Denise came with us and she went with, with your dad out to California, right? Yeah, I think yeah, I really I think it was all but one or two of the twenty something families that that worked in the Vinnie Brands office re relocated with the company, which I've always thought is just a a huge testament to the the company's uh, commitment to to taking care of its people. Yeah, exactly. Because people are always like Birmingham, Alabama, for such a you know good portfolio. That's a weird place for a wine importer to be, and but that's the story. And we actually still have one person who made the move, so, you know, Cheryl Hamilton, yeah. she made the move and she's still here, so, and she's young, so she'll be here for a while too. Yeah, it's cool. It's one of the things that, that I've always really enjoyed because Vineyard, for people who don't know, Vineyard Brands, in addition to its work as an importer and, and representative of the Perrin family and Bocastel and all of that, uh, Vineyard Brands represents our wines nationally. So um, we use the Vineyard Brands network of distributors and the Vineyard Brands salespeople are in a lot of ways our public face out around the country. And so every year um, in January, there's a Vineyard Brands National Sales Meeting. And so all of the suppliers come. I always come. And like, it's, it's fewer now, but there's still a decent number of people who go, who are there, who my dad hired originally back oh, sure. 30 years ago. Um, so the, the continuity um, across the generations is, is, is noteworthy. Yeah, it would when when I first started, I was walking around the shipping department, um, you know, introducing myself. And when I uh, got to the first person, she said, oh, I'm the newbie here. And I said, oh, really? How long have you been there? She was 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's unheard of in any other business. But we've had we have people who've been here for, you know, 35 years. Um, Danny worked with us, as you know, for 40 years and um, and then retired briefly and then is now back. So he's what's that 44 years, 45 years. Something like that. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, so what are the, what are the kind of through lines that you see from my dad's days up to, up to the current time? What are, how, how do you feel like Vineyard Brands, um, uh, has, what, has kept the things that matter or, and also what things have, have sort of, have you changed or have, have become less relevant and you've moved on from? So we've tried to keep as much as possible because I loved what your dad did and what your dad stood for. But, um, you know, one thing is that I think we should mention is that he had the foresight to, when he decided to retire, instead of sell the company, he created an employee stock ownership plan. So an ESOP. And that's who owns the majority of the company now. So literally every person, every employee at Vineyard Brands owns a part of the company. So that makes people really, they're, they're not just figuratively invested in the company, they're literally invested in the company. So that gives people a sense of, you know, of, of ownership and a sense of that they're, that they're building something for the future. So that's a big thing that, you know, we're hopefully never gonna get rid of, although it does create some headaches once a year, but that's fine. <laughs> um, um, but then, you know, one of the other things is your dad was real big on, you know, I mean, he obviously a man of integrity and a man of, you know, am amazing forethought, but um, he only, you know, he always said, he always told me at least, look, you're only as good as your name, right? So we don't just take on brands just to take on brands. You know, we don't have a long list like some of our peers have of here's our, here's our 900 different wineries you know, it's basically like a shopping list where, you know, you go buy it, um, you know, if you want it, we'll give, we'll get it to you. But um, we only, 
take on brands that we think, A, we have to like the wines, we have to like the people, and they have to have a place in our portfolio. So um, we don't just take on brands willy nilly. You know, we, we actively represent all of our brands. And if we don't think that we can do a good job, we just won't take them on. You know, we're not the type who says, oh yeah, sure, the more the merrier, and we'll just stick you on our list and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And we, we've had to do that. We, um, a couple of times since I've been here, one um, brand that we really um, liked personally, we didn't feel like we could represent them well. So we told them, you know, as much as we like you, we're not, it won't work for us. You know, we're gonna end up hating each other in a couple of years. So why don't we just not get together to begin with? And then we also had another winery where we loved the wines, we thought we could do a good job. I just didn't like the owner of the winery because he was just, we had so many disagreements before we even started working together. I thought, I thought, what's going to happen in four years? You know, no. I'm going to hate you and you're going to hate <laughs> me. So like, let's just not, let's just, you know, agree to be friends and never see each other. So. And I, I think one of the things that I still see as, uh, as, as, kind of a through line from my dad's idea and it was pretty unusual at the time and I feel like it's still fairly unusual now was that he thought it was really important to have a balance of estates and brands yep. um, and that each of them had a really important role to play in the portfolio of a successful importer but if you look at most other import importer models they tend to be very heavy towards one or the other and I feel like Vineyard Brands has managed to walk that line where um, there are all of uh, there are a, a pretty good number of really high profile, um, high prestige estates, uh, but that's not all that Vineyard Brand sells. It also has wines that are great values and that are larger brands that represent regions in ways that a single estate can't do. Yeah, yeah. So, so the only thing that's that's really throughout our portfolio is just the case for every winery is we only work with family owned wineries. So, and I think that was the case for your dad as well. So we, because we're sort of family owned, we just work better with families. You know, we think, we think like you guys think for the long term. you know, you, you plant a vineyard for your kids or your grandkids, you're not planting it for yourself. So we, because we don't have the, the same pressure of, you know, outside ownership, we don't, we just think for the long term like you guys do, but you're right. So we represent, you know, our smallest winery is Petrus, and we get about 300 bottles a year, and all the way up to Le Vieille Ferme that, you know, hopefully in the next little bit here, we'll be doing a million cases of that brand. So, I mean, that's, you know, from 300 bottles to 12 million bottles, that's a big difference, but they <laughs> You really could probably do... find yourself somewhere in that range. Like, who, if you are a winery, you could probably find yourself somewhere in that range. Quite literally, you can, <laughs> right, we got it all. So, and, but, but you're right, they, they really play off each other well in the portfolio um, is really resilient, we found out, right? So, you know, until COVID came, we were doing really well, you know, even even with the tariffs, right? We've, we've adapted for the tariffs. Um, but, you know, as COVID first started, people were moving towards the, the more value end of things because I think people were sort of freaking out and just didn't know what to do. But even now, the portfolio is coming around so that as people have settled into look, this is going to go on for a while. We might as well get on with our lives. Um, they're starting to buy the portfolio again. So where the brands carried us through the, the dark early days, now the whole portfolio is starting to sell again with, with a few exceptions. And, and, you know, some of the, you know, as people decide that, hey, I'm, I want to get a little bit adventurous again, just because I'm, you know, just because I'm in quarantine doesn't mean I can't have a good, you know, a good burgundy or something like that. So they're starting to be more adventurous, but. But yeah, no, it really is. Your dad always said that too, that, you know, it's good to have a, a mix. And I know some of our peers who didn't think that way, I'm pretty sure they're starting to think that way now. So um, you know, we're just happy to have, you know, we're happy that your dad set it up so well. So we're just carrying on with it. Uh, so talk about the tariffs, because I, I feel like that may, may have fallen off the radar of the average American wine lover now. But I mean, you're still dealing with, what, these are 25% tariffs on most European wines? So it's wines, it's certain wines from France that, that impact us. So actually for everyone, it's Germany, France, um, Spain, and the UK. And it's wines under 14% 14, 14 or under 
in under two liter containers, not sparkling, not what else is there? Not, I mean, it's just this random group of things, but um, you know, is if that wasn't bad enough, then in December, there was a threat that it was gonna move up to 100% and literally sweep in all wines from those countries you know, so sparkling would get included and over 14%. The only thing they were still going to carve out was between two and six liters somehow, which is weird, but whatever. Um, but so they decided to leave those where they were, which is good because there was a big um, um, outcry from wine lovers. And even, you know, I, I know you were very supportive in getting rid of the tariffs because it doesn't, it's not just, it, it, it hurts the whole industry, not just the, not just the imported wine industry. But yeah, so, I mean, yeah. The, the idea, and this is this is all part of a of a airline manufacturing spat, right? right? I mean, this it's, is this is an Airbus. This is like an Airbus retaliation for. It was an Airbus. Years. It's an Airbus Boeing dispute, right? That, um, I mean, how, what so, do we have to do with that? And so, I think the idea in applying these was that um, you punish a, a European industry at the benefit of. American counterparts, but what what I think the people who crafted this, if that's not too strong a word, um, didn't understand is that the same ecosystem sells imported wines and domestic wines. And if you have a big increase in costs for um, what might amount to half of the portfolio for your average distributor, the result is going to be chaos. I mean, you'll have yeah. distributors going out of business. You'll have salespeople getting laid off. Um, it's not like you can just smoothly transfer all of those European wines into um, U.S. production because the U.S. doesn't produce enough. Um, exactly. the U.S. surplus production, I mean, U.S. production is less than U.S. consumption by quite a bit. Um, and so what you'd end up having, I think, is you end up having some of the other New World regions benefiting. Um, you might benefit... Chile and Australia and Argentina um, at the expense of Europe and a whole lot of disruption to the whole, the whole distribution ecosystem, restaurants. Right, right, exactly. So, so, what we, so what we did, as you know, we worked with, because we didn't want to disrupt our sales channels and all of the places. to get our pricing to as close to pre-COVID levels as we could. And thank goodness, because if we would have lost those placements and then COVID came along, we would be... Uh... So... I'm not Sorry, sure you the were to... I've had a... Yeah, I lost you for a minute there too. I think it's probably, probably my end, not your end, given that you're in New York City and I'm in the middle of the woods. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that that's your your ability to figure out a response to the tariffs that everybody sort of eats a little bit of that cost, so that there's not this massive disruption at the the end point of the market. Was, I mean, really, really impressive that you were able to make it happen. Yeah, and you know, and they gave us 16 days to do it, right? They announced the tariffs and they went into effect 16 days later, so there wasn't a lot of time. And I remember I was in Croatia when this happened, so I was doing it on a tour bus, talking to all of these suppliers, like, "Hey, here's what we're gonna do. Can you, do you want to join in?" But um, yeah, so but and and it really hasn't. What we found out, it really hasn't benefited the other New World countries at all because people weren't people who want. Um, you know, if they if they want a good burgundy, they want a good burgundy. They don't, you know, there's not a substitute for that. So, um, and but once the a lot of um, Congress people got involved to say like, look, these tariffs should go away, period. But they sh certainly shouldn't go to 100 percent. And now that COVID has impacted the, the our whole industry so much, they've now said, come on, you just need to get rid of them. And from what I understand, the administration is actually listening and they didn't quite understand the whole three tier system because it is complicated, but um, they do now. And apparent from what I understand, my fingers are crossed, but hopefully they're 
you know, actually negotiating with or the both sides are negotiating to get rid of them because they're just not, you know, we've had enough problems that we don't need these things to continue. So no, for sure. Uh, okay, well, good. Um, that's that's encouraging. I hadn't realized that that maybe those were going to come off the off the table. That's that'd be great for everybody. I mean, fingers crossed. Yeah, seriously. Um, okay, so talk a little bit. You mentioned earlier that in the early the early months of COVID, um, things switched mostly or really shifted towards the the, the more value end of the portfolio. Um, and what, what's your assessment of things now? I mean, I know that some restaurants are reopening, sometimes with reduced capacity. Some restaurants are not reopening. There's still a lot of sales happening at retail. It's still above what the baseline was. E-commerce sales are up. So what's, how, how would you describe the kind of state of the American wine market now six months into COVID? So um, off-premise, so retail is huge, right, which is, which is great. It hasn't, for us at least, it hasn't quite made up for the loss of the, of the on-premise side of things, but it's picked up quite a bit. So, and the, and the, the good things that have come from, from COVID with, or, so on-premise is still restaurants and you know, hotels and all that are really still suffering, but they've re they've relaxed a lot of the restrictions because, as you know, you know the alcohol um, industry is one of the most heavily and crazily regulated that I, I that I've ever seen. Um, and I usually work in um, all my restructurings were in regulated industries, so this is a nutty one. Um, but you know, they've really they've re they've changed some regulations so that you know, with takeout you can. If you're a restaurant, you can, as long as you send food, you can send wine too. So you can become, you're almost a retailer, yeah. right? So, um, and hopefully those things are gonna, are gonna stay. Here in New York, they've allowed restaurants to take over, you know, with a few restrictions, take over their sidewalks. So there's a lot of outdoor dining going on. And they've also put in, they call it open streets restaurants, but that they, they're closing they're closing streets for certain days and letting people then take over the street as well. So it's actually, it's actually amazing. I mean, cause you know, New York isn't, doesn't have a ton of outdoor dining options like other places, you know, like Paris or Rome or something, but now they're starting to, and I've even seen some, um, some uh, restaurant tourists come from other States just cause they want to sit outside in New York and eat like the Parisians do, or, you know, the Romans do. So, um, so I think they're, they're doing everything they can, the restaurants to, 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 to sort of thrive as best they can, but I don't think they're actually thriving. Huh. I think we might be having another connection issue. I can see you clearly, Greg, but I can't hear you right now. Um... I don't know. Can you hear me? Uh, huh. Again, I can see I can see you, but can't hear you, uh, which is really weird. I, I don't know if somebody who is watching can add in a comment if they can see and hear us both. That would be helpful to know. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, well, I'm waiting to see if... Uh, if this, if the audio piece of this connection gets back together, um, if uh, if people would like to know a little more, so now Catherine says no more sound on Greg's side. See both, only hear Jason. Hmm. Okay, um, Greg, do you want to leave and then um, come back in, and I will. Um, I think when I readmit you, it will. Um, it should the sound will probably come back on. Okay. Great, he just left. Uh, welcome back to beautiful, sunny Paso Robles. Well, he comes back in, uh, show you a little bit about the day. It is absolutely perfect. It's supposed to top out in the low 90s. Um, and, then, um, and then cool down into the upper 40s at night. So that's glorious. It is just perfect weather for harvest. Okay, I just uh, saw Greg. I invited him to come back on. And sorry about that. Hey, perfect. It worked. A call, a call came in and did something to my audio. <laughs> okay, um, cool. So, 
sorry, you were talking um, about some of the cool opportunities that now restaurants have to take over outdoor spaces in um, in places like New York. And the same thing's happening out here in Paso Robles. I mean, you go, Absolutely. you go, and like every sidewalk has these like barriers that are moved out into it, and a lot of the parking spaces are gone. And instead, there's tables out there, and people are actually yeah. using that space instead of parked cars. I mean, it's a, right. it seems like such a good trade off. I totally agree. And hopefully after this is all over, which hopefully is soon, they'll, le they'll let some of this continue because yeah. it really is, it's changing for, for the good, the way, the way people eat. That would be nice to go back inside as well. <laughs> and, but hey, especially in the winter. Yeah, we just, uh, San Luis Obispo County just got below the threshold that they needed to resume indoor dining at reduced capacity. So that's, huh. that's, that's an achievement, I think, for the for the region we're still outside wineries are still still have to be outside but i'm fine okay. with that yeah right um well uh, so we're almost at half an hour um a couple questions what what are you what are you really excited about drinking right now what wines what wines uh have you do you always want to have around or have you had that you've opened and have been really exciting in the last what, whatever weeks or month so when you showed the picture of the Rusan, I just finished my last bottle of your 2014 Rusan that is just spectacular. So I love that. Um, I've been drinking, our producer in Sauterne has just started making um, a dry um, semillon that's, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm going for the more crisp, um, you know, the crisp sort of summery wines at the moment. So, and I'm, and Grenat, I found that, not that I ever lost it, but there, I found a new love for Grenache. Yeah. It's just so good, right? Yeah. Oh, it's such an amazing grape. Um, yeah. Oh, I see that Thibaut, uh, Thibaut Ligé Belair just, just, just is on this call. Hey, Thibaut. Thibaut, Hi, Thibaut. is uh, one of the great uh, Burgundy suppliers and Beaujolais suppliers for Vineyard Brands. Um, yes. Cool. Um, so one last question, sort of what, if you look in your crystal ball, um, what of the things that have happened during COVID, like you mentioned, uh, relaxing? Hey, are you back, Greg? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, I lost you for a second. So um, quick question. So what of the things that have happened in COVID, which of them do you think are going to be durable? And which are the things that you think are going to go back to normal as soon as society kind of goes back to normal, as soon as there's a vaccine or whatever it is that, that, that spurs that? You mentioned already the relaxation selling wine, but what else? Yeah, so I think I think definitely once there's a vaccine or you know, or this all just passes, that um, I think definitely people will go back to indoor dining because it was you know just something that you know it's there. That's a certain experience you can't recreate outside. But um, I do hope that you know the rest of it, the take the wine with the takeaway, food and delivery, um, and the outdoor dining. I hope that continues because people just love it. So, but that's up to the regulators and. I was doing a call with someone the other day who, who happens to be a restaurateur here in Brooklyn, but he said, do you think that, you know, the, the, the retailers are going to push back once this is all over um, against, you know, sort of allowing restaurants to be retailers? And do you think that they'll have any luck? And I said, I don't know, I'm sure that they will push back, but I'm not sure that's not going to fall on deaf ears because retailers have been doing so well during all this, most of them, some of them haven't been, but, um, when restaurants have been absolutely decimated, it's hard to say, hey, help us retailers squash the restaurants that have had such a hard time of it. So hopefully that stuff continues. And like I said, so right at the beginning of COVID, when um, the um, when people were sort of retreating to the value side and just sort of the things that they 
um, we're very comfortable with, they're now coming back to um, wanting to explore a wider range, at least in our portfolio. So I think that's just going to continue because I think that was more, it was, that was less the lockdowns than more of the shock of it all and the real unknown of it. So I don't think we still know what the new normal is going to look like or when it's going to look like whatever it's going to look like. But I do think that people are less panicked about it. You know, it's, it's going to end sooner or later. So, you know, and, and I think, I think most people are, are more optimistic than they were back in, you know, mid March when it looked like the whole world was ending. Yep. So. I think that's true for sure. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, I know the stuff that we've seen, I feel like there's a lot of people who have done stuff for the first time and realize that it's, it's actually a nice addition to the way that they, the way that they um, approach wine and approach, approach just their purchasing. I mean, we, we know that a lot of people made their first ever online order with us during the shutdowns. They just oh, never yeah. done it before. They, they were wine club members. They came to our tasting room. They, um, they would get wine, but they'd never actually gone onto our website, made an account and placed an order. And once they do it, they're like, oh, that was really easy. Right. Um, so I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of things like that, that people have learned how to do things a little bit differently. And I think there are going to be some lasting, lasting changes, like a shift towards e-commerce and, and things like that. I, I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's super easy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, I kept you longer than I meant to. I appreciate you taking the, the time to, to oh. come on and, and, and share a little bit of what's going on in your world. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, www.vineyardbrands.com. Sounds it's, pretty straightforward. Uh, our, our whole our whole story is there. <laughs> our whole portfolio is there. Um, reach out to me or or Catherine Coutier is on this call as well. We're ha always happy to tell our story. So awesome. Uh, so thanks for having us on. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for uh, sticking with us in the in the in the connectivity blitz. But um, okay, so that was Greg Duty, um, CEO of Vineyard Brands. Um, and again, I will do this every other Wednesday. So I'll see you in two weeks. And looking forward to it. So again, thanks for thanks for everybody's interest and outreach and support of us during these new and interesting times. And thank you, Greg, for joining me. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Jason. Okay, take care.